Hello and welcome to this video in which I discuss six reasons for a low Cronbach's alpha. My name is Christian Geiser. I'm an instructor and statistical consultant with Quantfish and on this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials. I usually talk about multivariate methods including factor analysis and structural equation modeling and also about topics in psychometrics such as reliability and scale analysis, classical test theory and item response theory. If this is something that interests you, please subscribe to this channel. Also check out the description for additional resources including courses that I offer through Quantfish. In this video, I want to discuss six common reasons for obtaining an insufficient or unsatisfactory Cronbach's alpha coefficient. Before we get into those six reasons, I want to briefly explain what Cronbach's alpha actually is and when it is used and what it is used for. So Cronbach's alpha conceptually is a composite reliability index for tau equivalent measures. Now, what does this mean? So what is a composite reliability coefficient and what are tau equivalent measures? A composite reliability index is a reliability index for the sum or average of a number of items or tests that are supposed to measure a common latent variable or true score variable. And so in the specific case of Cronbach's alpha, what is the underlying measurement model is a model of tau equivalent measure. So for example, here we have four components of a test y1 through y4. So those could be subtests of, for example, a math test or an intelligence test, or those could be four different items of a depression scale. And so in the tau equivalent measurement model, we assume that there is a single common true score variable tau or a single common factor that underlies the item responses or the test responses and that the, the tests have equal factor loadings on that component or on that factor, which you can see here where the factor loadings all have been fixed to one. And so though that's meant by tau equivalence is that the components measure a single factor with equal loadings and that there are no correlations between error terms in this factor model. So you can see here that the epsilon measurement error variables at the bottom are not allowed to correlate. So the tau equivalence model is a special model of classical test theory where we have a single factor and equal loadings and Cronbach's alpha applies to that particular measurement model. And this is something that many people don't realize and we'll get back to that point when we talk about the six reasons for a low Cronbach's alpha because one of those reasons as we will see can be that the measurement model of tau equivalence does not apply to your components here. So then how does Cronbach's alpha work? Here you can see the formula, which is not super intuitive and not super interesting to look at, but you can see from the alpha formula that what goes into it are M tests. So that's the number of components. And then also the variances of the individual components here in the numerator, specifically the sum of the variances. And then in the denominator, you have the variance of the composite or the variance of the sum and S is defined here as the sum or as the average of the M test score variables Y1 through YM. In our case, S would be Y1 plus Y2 plus Y3 plus Y4. And so if we wanted to find out about the reliability of the sum or average, the aggregate of those four components. And if we were willing to assume that the model of tau equivalence fits, then we could use Cronbach's alpha to determine the reliability of S, the reliability of the composite of those four measurements. Now let's talk about the six reasons that are common in practice for obtaining an unsatisfactory or very low Cronbach's alpha. The first one is that you have unreliable measures. The second one may be that you have too few measures. The third one is the measures are multidimensional. Number four, the measurement model is incorrect. Number five, you have a highly homogeneous population. And number six, your sample size is insufficient. 
I want to go over each one of those six reasons for you in detail here. So number one is perhaps the most intuitive one that comes to mind right away, and that is when your measures are unreliable. Obviously, Cronbach's alpha is a measure of reliability, specifically a measure of composite reliability, and therefore when measures contain a lot of measurement error, then that may result in a low Cronbach's alpha. Reliability in general in classical test theory is defined as the proportion of true score variance or variance tau over total observed variance, where observed variance is the sum of true score variance plus error variance. And so obviously, when your measures are unreliable, then you don't have a lot of true score variance in your scores. And then that can cause the, uh, the reliability of S to be low through Cronbach's alpha because S does contain a lot of measurement error and not a lot of true score variance. How can this happen? So how is it possible to obtain unreliable measures or what are reasons for unreliable measures? One example can be when you have questionnaire items and they are unclear or convoluted in their wording. And I came up here with a example. So let's say we have a questionnaire item here that targets a person's emotions or a person's behavior. And that item reads often when I don't sleep well and I'm in an argument with my spouse, I'm having trouble focusing on my work and become impatient and irritable. So this item is really long. It contains a lot of different aspects. People may not understand the whole sentence because it is so long already. And then also it contains different aspects, some of which may be true, some of which may not be true. So for example, people um, may sleep well generally, so the item may not apply to them, or they may not be in arguments with their spouses very often, or they may not have trouble focusing on their work, or they may not be impatient, or they may be impatient but not irritable. And so there are too many aspects, so say, that are being measured with this item at once, and so this may cause confusion. People may think that this item does not apply to them or not fully, so they don't know how to respond to it. And so those can be reasons for measurement error, or of course there can be uh, a gazillion other reasons for why items or scales or subtests may be unreliable. And so then this would be a reason to obtain a, an insufficient Cronbach's alpha. And of course that's possible. However, in my experience, that's often not the main reason for obtaining a low Cronbach's alpha, but rather one of the remaining five points are often what explains a low Cronbach's alpha, even though measures are reasonably reliable. So let's get to the other points. Number two, the scale consists of too few measures. As we know from classical test theory, random errors of measurement average out. However, in order for that to happen, we need to have a sufficient number of items and or a sufficient number of subtests in our composite so that this can actually take place, meaning that we can get rid of measurement error through having enough components where some will overestimate the score, some will underestimate the true score, and then over time those negative and positive deviations from the true score will average out as we form the sum or the average of a sufficient number of items or components. And so this means that one of the fundamental laws, so to say, from classical test theory is that longer scales are more highly reliable all other things being equal, and that applies to Cronbach's alpha as well as a composite reliability measure, meaning Cronbach's alpha will be higher as you have more tau equivalent components in your scale. So if you add more tau equivalent components, all other things being equal, the scale will have a higher reliability. We also know that from the Spearman-Brown formula from classical test theory, which applies to tau parallel measures, so that's more restricted. And if you're interested, I have a separate video or multiple videos on tau parallel measurement and the Spearman-Brown formula that you can check out as well. However, here I just want to point out that Spearman-Brown uh, 
formalizes, so to say, this law that longer scales are more reliable. And you can even depict that in a graph. So here we have on the x axis, the number of tests, so up to m components or m items. And on the y axis, we have the reliability. And so you can see that, for example, when we start out with one component that has a reliability of only 0.5, then as we add a second component, in this case, a parallel component, the reliability already increases to uh, something above 0.65. And then as we add a third parallel component, then we're already at about 0.75 with the reliability. So as we add more components, or more subscales, more items to a test, then all other things being right as well, we will get a higher reliability. So this means that Cronbach's alpha can sometimes be low when you have a scale that has only two or three or four items, that's maybe not enough for a sufficient Cronbach's alpha because each individual item may contain a lot of measurement error. And so in order for that to average out, you need to add more items. And so Spearman Brown can help you figure this out using this graph, for example, where you can see, okay, how many items, parallel items do I have to add in order for that to become more reliable. Number three is multidimensional measures. So this is also a problem and that is actually a frequent problem that I see, especially with questionnaire data, that the items measure more than one latent variable or factor. Remember that the measurement model that is implied by Cronbach's alpha is a single factor tau equivalence measurement model where the items measure one and only one factor tau, one latent variable, and other than that, just measurement error. And so when you have questionnaire data, oftentimes a measurement model with just a single factor and uncorrelated errors is oftentimes too restrictive. It doesn't fit. Here's an example. So let's say you want to measure positive effect and you have five items that are happy, satisfied, calm, content, good, and you have people rate those items, let's say on a five or six point Likert scale from very much to not at all or something like that. And so then the question is, is happy the exact same thing as satisfied? Can I be happy but not satisfied? Maybe not. Maybe those would be highly correlated and uh, measuring about the same thing. But then what about calm? Calm, somewhat different, right? From happy or satisfied. So that's a different dimension. Content, good. So here the question is, so say how much specific variance is there in each item? Those are probably highly correlated and they do measure probably a common factor of positive effect. However, there may still be specific variance in addition to error variance in these items. And so when you fit a single factor model to those data, then you might have an overestimation of the error component because these items contain specific variance in addition to measurement error variance. Moreover, it could also be that really more than one factor is measured. And I want to illustrate this here with example two. So let's say you have positively and negatively worded items. So you, let's say you have happy and satisfied on the positive side, and then you have unhappy and dissatisfied on the negative side. Then typically what happens is that happy and satisfied will be more highly correlated and unhappy and dissatisfied will be more highly correlated with one another. Then will be items uh, across those positive and negative um, sub dimensions, so to say. So the positive items will be highly correlated, negative high, uh, items will be highly correlated, but across those positive and negative items, the correlations will be lower. And so that's at odds with a single factor model. And oftentimes then we will find that a two factor model is needed. So in summary, item specific variance will increase your error variance component, it will lower the true score variance component, and that will lead to a lower Cronbach's alpha when you have multi dimensional measures. Also, when a single factor doesn't fit as we would expect in a second example case with positive and negative items, or when you have other items that have method effects or systematically shared specific variance, then a single factor 
tau equivalence model may not fit at all. So you may need more than one factor or you may need method factors, in which case Cronbach's alpha simply would not apply and would likely lead to an underestimation of the reliability of these measures, which means that here your measures wouldn't be unreliable, but instead the problem would be that Cronbach's alpha doesn't apply because the measurement model is not one of tau equivalents. Number four is related to number three when you have an incorrect measurement model. And so this is more subtle here in number four in that a tau equivalence measurement model may not apply. So remember that a tau equivalence measurement model not only requires that there only be a single factor uh, that underlies the responses, but also that all the factor loadings are fixed to one or that all the factor loadings are equal across the components. That's called tau equivalence. But that's not always the case. Sometimes we have measures that measure a single factor, but the loadings differ. So then we call that a congeneric measurement model that you can see here on the right hand side where lambda 2 may be different from 1, lambda 3 may be different from 1, and lambda 4 may be different from 1. And so when measures have different unstandardized factor or loadings, then Cronbach's alpha underestimates the reliability of the sum. And then you should choose a different composite reliability coefficient, such as McDonald's omega, which is appropriate for congeneric measures that have different unstandardized factor loadings. Number five, your population is highly homogeneous. This is something that many people don't know or don't realize is that when we look at the reliability formula again, we can see that the true score variance component is in the numerator. And so when you have a population where everybody scores the same in the most extreme case, so where everybody has the same true score, let's say. So let's say you analyze a population of highly gifted individuals with an IQ test. And so everybody has the same IQ, like in the extreme case or near, near equal IQ score in terms of their true scores, then you have very little or no true score variance potentially. And then the reliability coefficient will be zero. When you have zero true score variance, then the numerator of this formula becomes zero, then the whole thing becomes zero. And then there's no reliability. So a highly homogeneous population with little variance in the true scores can cause Cronbach's alpha or any reliability coefficient to be low because the reliability coefficient is a variance dependent measure. It's a variance dependent statistic. And so it depends on how much variance you have. Now, if you have a huge representative sample with lots of lots of variability, then this shouldn't be an issue. But when you look at a specific population where people score similarly on your constructs of interest, then this could be an issue. And then finally, number six is something that applies to pretty much any statistical analysis, and that is when you have an insufficient sample size. So the reliability statistic, like any statistic, may itself be unreliable when you have too small a sample. And this is something that you can address by running simulation studies to determine the proper n for a given a factor model of tau equivalence. I offer a workshop that is free on Quantfish on sample size planning via simulations in M plus that you can check out where I show how you can simulate models, including CFA models to determine the appropriate sample size for reliable estimates. And so for the reliability coefficient, this may be something where you need 100 or 120 or 150 cases in order to properly estimate this coefficient. I hope you found this video useful to learn about the six most common reasons for a low Cronbach's alpha. If you did, please subscribe to this channel. Don't forget to check out the description for additional resources, including a course on classical test theory that I teach for Quantfish. And I'll see you next time.